Typically, in the sport of college football, when two teams take the field to play against each other, there are a few drives where each team is figuring out, quote-unquote, figuring out the other team. Let me just start this video off by saying I don't think that will be the case here. Even though these two teams are far from identical, they share a whole lot in common. Um, more than you may think on the surface, though I think if you research both of these teams and you watch them, you know what similarities I'm talking about. Both teams have a Heisman caliber quarterback, an All-American caliber quarterback. Both teams have near elite in the case of USC and I think elite in the case of Washington wide receiver rooms. Both also have elite play callers at the offensive coordinator or head coach position. Um, Ryan Grubb is, I believe, the play caller for Washington, and Lincoln Riley, I know for a fact, is the play caller for USC. And both call great games. USC's offense has struggled at times this season, but let's not forget that Washington's has as well. Uh, failing to score an offensive touchdown against Arizona State is rancid. And speaking of rancid, both of these defenses, though much more so USC's, have had their own bouts of disappointment. Washington's defense, in their most recent game, struggled against the almighty and holier-than-thou Stanford Cardinals. That sentence obviously reeks with sarcasm, allowing 33 points to Stanford. However, I will say that, in my opinion, that was closer to a fluke than not for Washington's defense, which isn't an elite defense, but a defense that was able to slow down Oregon's offense at times, slow down Arizona's offense, which now we know to be a force to be reckoned with. They were able to basically win Washington their game against Arizona State, USC's defense is just a maggot-infested corpse. That's what USC's defense is. USC's defense is the deer that has its head taken off on the side of the highway. It holds the team back. You gave Lincoln Riley Ohio State's defense or Michigan's defense or Penn State's defense, um, Iowa's defense, even Rutgers' defense or Wisconsin's or Nebraska's USC this year, if, if they were put in the Big Ten, it would be a competition of USC and, oh, I don't know. I, I really have to think hard about this one. It would be between USC and I would say Purdue for probably the least effective or least efficient defense. Maybe Maryland, given they have more talent than Purdue, and also maybe Michigan State. Um, not a great place to be if you're the USC Trojans, especially on the horizon of joining the Big Ten, a defensive physical conference. And from what I can tell, this season, Washington fits in with the Big Ten in terms of trench play, defensive play, and even more so, despite not being run heavy this season, in fact, they're one of the least potent or least used rather rushing attacks in all of college football the huskies i think fit in with the big 10 much better than usc right now welcome back fellow football fanatics it's your host college football with sam if you are a washington fan a usc fan or a ucla or oregon fan this is the best big 10 football channel on youtube so i encourage you to subscribe to the channel right now before you forget Click the notification bell so you can get notified when I cover more of Washington and USC football, both this season and in the 2024 preseason and beyond as a part of the Big Ten Conference. This game's very intriguing because it's not a top 10 matchup. It isn't. Um, in fact, USC, by the college football playoff rankings, is 20th. Washington is 5th. This is a top 25 matchup. And in my own top 25 ranking system, I don't even have USC ranked. I think they've performed extremely um, at a poverty level over the past few weeks. Meanwhile, I think Washington, while falling from grace because of their struggles, is still one of the better teams in all of college football. 
But that is just what has happened. That is not what is going to happen. There's a lot of unknown here. Um, USC is favored by FPI, and I would argue by Vegas to win this game because Washington, as we'll see here in a minute, um, by previewing the matchup, is only a three-point favorite on the road. That's typically an indicator that um, Vegas, especially when as many people are betting on Washington as is the case, well over 50% are picking Washington to cover that three-point spread. It's an indicator that Vegas thinks highly of the home field team's chances of pulling off an upset, at least from my interpretation. Before we resume, please like this video as well and share it with Washington, USC, Oregon, UCLA friends and buddies and and college football acquaintances of yours so that we can grow this community to 20,000 subscribers. Comment your own predictions for this game down in the comment section below, and also check out my Patreon page via the link in the description and also the pinned comment in the comment section so that you can support the channel if you wish. Your support's always appreciated but never expected, and if you're an All-American or Heisman patron, you get bonus content. Potential power, as I've mentioned in prior videos, and for those of you who are new to the channel perhaps, potential power is a power rating system that I am working on to help predict game outcomes, along with spreads as well. I want it to be efficient at picking the spread um, and obviously picking the money line and choosing who is going to win, and also decide fairly, fairly early in the season before any statistics come out who is going to eventually win it all, like be an effective preseason predictor and also regular season and game-by-game -game prediction machine. It's going to be very hard to do. Maybe it's an unreasonable goal, but it's a side project of mine that I very much enjoy working on. I'm not doing it this week because I'm trying to automate it and make my life easier because I've spent hours a week or have spent hours in every week in the past tweaking it and updating the rankings from every Power 5 game, and that's very time-consuming, and I'd rather, you know, cover more games, and potential power is essentially my rankings for every position group based off of, you know, statistics, pro football focus grades, um, you know, talent of the player, you know, from their recruiting ranking, but more importantly from how I think they've been developed. So my opinion is still on the power rankings. They're just weighted with different statistics from a multitude of categories. But to get back on track, to not go off on a tangent there, I apologize if I did, Washington would be picked by potential power to blow the Trojans off the rails. That's not the case with FPI. Typically potential power, because it's, you know, inspired actually by FPI. I thought the concept of football power index and efficiency was cool, so I wanted to mimic it. Typically, they are in agreement on a variety of things. They have some differences, of course. I prioritize different things than ESPN does and still have predicted over 50% of spreads and 75% of money lines, but here we are. This is intriguing to me because potential power, I don't think, can grasp a lot of things correctly yet. It's very young, definitely in the alpha stage of development, my power ranking system is. And I'm telling you, the Huskies would be favored in this game by potential power to win by more than two touchdowns, potentially more than three. Potential power hated USC's defense. It would still hate it now because they surrendered 49 to California in a game where uh, Cal choked to USC. That should be a phrase that is never uttered, ever, in college football. Um, yet it was after this past Saturday. And the offense was also viewed as overrated and ineffective given their talent. Meanwhile, Washington, and, and I agree with my model on this at least, Washington's a much more effective, efficient team. They have less talent, less four-star and five-star talent, but their coaches, especially on defense, have put this talent to better use. You look at Michael Penix and, you know, compare him to Caleb Williams. Uh, Michael Penix may not have a long career or a career outside of the practice squad 
in the NFL. Maybe that's taking it too extreme, but his his injury history, the fact that he hasn't performed well in the past two games, if that trend were to continue, that would take a huge hit to what I think is a very volatile NFL draft stock. I think he's a good player, but I'm not exactly the best when grading players by you know how good of an NFL prospect they are. I do know, though, that Caleb Williams is much more, much more talented, and he's projected to go number one overall in the 2024 NFL draft. Both are elite college quarterbacks, and personally, looking at Penix and looking at Williams and how they've both performed this season, I'd rather have Penix, personally, as my quarterback. I think he's the better quarterback. But from a raw talent perspective, it would be dishonest to say that Caleb Williams doesn't have better, you know, tools assigned to him physically. And after all, he was a five-star coming out of high school. Washington is schematically more efficient, and I think they have a better strength and conditioning program as well. They're 8-0. USC is 7-2. and Yet, according to FPI, like taking the football power index point values and, you know, subtracting USC's from Washington, since you, Washington is ahead, and then adding three points to USC, because the average home field advantage measured in points would be about three in college football, USC, in fact, would be favored by about one point. You look at the Vegas line, Washington's favored by three, and I think a part of that is due to a lot of people look at this game and they pick Washington to win. In fact, I imagine that many of my own subscribers, when they saw my poll on this, are thinking, are you kidding me? Is this even a question? Look at these numbers here. Washington was picked by 86% of those who voted on my community poll to to flat out win this game. Only 14% of people uh, picked USC. That is typically something, you know, that margin of opinion on who's going to win, that disparity is only seen when, let's say, a top 10 team plays an unranked team. For example, 87, 86, 85 percent of my voters on my Michigan versus Purdue poll picked Michigan to win. Uh, 13, 14, 15% picked Purdue to win. That's the same ratio for Michigan versus Purdue, as is the case with Washington, who isn't as good as Michigan, traveling on the road to play a team that's much better than Purdue in USC. Washington clearly is a favorite of a large kind by the general audience, which typically isn't something good. I'm uneasy looking at that. Because I think Washington is the better team. Then again, upsets happen. The better team doesn't always win. USC right now could be in wounded animal mode. They got away with a win against Cal that honestly, Cal should have won that game. But you take the chances that you get. And Lincoln Riley isn't some, you know, poverty coach who's, you know, only in this position because he, you know, inherited a a Nick Saban program. Like, no, he's been criticized by me, rightfully so. I think he's overrated in the national media, but I think he's overrated in the context of him often being placed as like a top five, top six, top eight head coach. I think he's top 15. That means I still view Lincoln Riley as a great head coach, a, a man who can adapt and lead his players, develop his players, and function as a CEO. I think the latter part of that description is the area in which Lincoln Riley needs to work on. I think that, you know, his players really connect with them. I mean, Caleb Williams, I was reading this story quite a while ago, but he was considering walking on at Oklahoma when Brock Vandegrift was committed to them just so he could be developed by Lincoln Riley. I mean, especially quarterbacks have a great connection and honor of Riley. Riley's problem is he doesn't know what a good defense is, and I don't know if he cares to have a good defense. And if he doesn't fix that, uh, he is never winning a national title. He might never win a college football playoff game, even with the expanded playoff, if that occurs. And USC might take, you know, 
uh, steel toe boot kick to the face and lose their front teeth if there aren't changes made after this season. But I anticipate with USC allowing 32.6 points per game on defense, there have to be changes. Their defense resides outside of the top 110 in scoring, which is just, it's, it truly is, it, it truly is asinine. Washington's 14th in football power index rankings. USC is 17th. Washington was 14th just, you know, back in September. I remember because I made a video about them traveling to East Lansing to play Michigan State. But Washington rose into the top 10, and now they've come a little bit down back to earth since they've struggled in back-to-back games against, you know, opponents with losing records in Arizona State and Stanford two of the worst teams in the Pac-12. USC dominated Stanford. They struggled with Arizona State, but not to the same degree. What separates these two teams, and why I think a lot of people are picking Washington, is Washington has won a big game. They beat Oregon, arguably in a game where some, including myself, said that Oregon outplayed them. And Washington is also undefeated. And they didn't need this monumental you know, double-digit comeback full of awful decisions and turnovers to beat California. They they didn't need that. They're 8-0. USC, 7-2. and They dominate the week, but Notre Dame blew them out. Uh, Utah, they um, Alex Grinch made Bryson Barnes look like prime Lamar Jackson on that final game-winning drive. Both of these teams have a lot of question marks in, you know, in this matchup, in the short-term view. But long-term, looking at this season and at their body of work, there is no denying right now that Washington is the better team. No denying that whatsoever. I think that their defense has had some problems, um, particularly in defending, you know, the pass. I think their rush defense was very admirable until, you know, two games ago where Arizona State was able to run the football on them and, you know, pound the rock. What helps USC a lot in this matchup is their home field advantage. Washington is one of the loudest stadiums in all of college football, and you do have to travel not time zones, but a great distance from Los Angeles to Seattle. I mean, there is some distance there. Um... Jet lag, I think jet lag's a term used for time zones, but there is distance traveled. Overall, Washington is favored, I think rightfully so. FPI factoring in what I assume would be home field advantage would favor, by my calculation of what an FPI spread would look like, would favor USC, and that reflects with USC being given a 54% chance to win, according to FPI and ESPN's official analytics page. I am shocked how many of you, my subscribers, are picking Washington to win. I thought that it would be maybe, you know, 60-30, um, or 60-40, rather, or 65-35, or maybe 70-30 in favor of Washington. But 86 to 14, like, percentage points, that's a, I mean, that's a pretty that's a pretty big favorite. Like I mentioned, that's a comparable ratio of favoritism to Michigan over Purdue in these weekly polls. If you want to, you know, participate in these polls, and I encourage that you do because your vote is counted because I show the results of these polls in the matchup section of my videos, click the notification bell and click all notifications. And I think you get notified when I do, I'm notified when I make posts. Thank you very much. Looking at these position advantages, I imagine that if you're a USC fan right now, um, you're thinking that I'm asinine. I had a similar position advantage chart for Washington over Oregon, and I need to explain some things here. Washington had an 8-2 to two position advantage over Oregon, but where Oregon had their few position advantages it was undeniable that Oregon was better in those positions, those being running back and, I believe, defensive back is where I thought Oregon, by no doubt, had the better players by quite a wide margin. 
And Oregon, I thought that Washington had the better O-line, that Washington had the better tight end, better quarterback, um, better defensive line. But there were arguments that Oregon was better in those areas. And, and even staff, too. There's an argument that Oregon has the better staff than Washington. In fact, right now, um, despite the fact that Oregon lost to Washington, I have Oregon ahead of Washington in my top 25 because I think that Oregon in outplaying Washington despite losing in that rivalry matchup in Seattle has also dominated everyone else they have faced except for an early road test against Texas Tech. So outside of that one head-to-head matchup, they've looked overall better and they have more talent, like raw four-star, five-star talent. They have a higher blue chip ratio. That's typically a good indicator of success. It's not necessarily the same case here. I think USC, there's an argument they have the better quarterback. There's an argument for USC that they have the better tight end. Lake McGree has been good this year. I think there's also an argument that USC has the better defensive back room. That's a big weakness for both of these teams. Maybe, uh, but I doubt it. I'm actually going to scrap that. Maybe if you want to stretch it, you can say USC is the better defensive line, but I don't think so. I think quarterback, defensive back, maybe tight end, even not defensive line. Those are areas you could argue SC to have an advantage in. I think that Kalen DeBoer, the staff that he's put together, just it puts his players in a better position to win. Alex Grinch has Bear Alexander, Christian Roland Wallace, Damani Jackson, Eric Gentry, Mason Cobb, Jack Sullivan, What does their defense do outside of open the door to the robber armed with an AK-47 and let them and and let the opposing offense, you know, take all of your valuables? Defense does nothing outside of generate a few sacks, generate a few annoying turnovers, etc. Washington's defense, on the other hand, has had games where, like Arizona State, they showed up and they won Washington the game. Other matchups where they bullied Michigan State, they, you know, limited Arizona until the final few minutes of the fourth quarter to less than 20 points. That's impressive. They held Oregon to 0 of 3 on fourth down. And if not for Washington's own inconsistencies in the passing game on offense that day, the defense might have held Oregon to less than 30 points and Washington's offense might have scored more than, you know, more than 40 And the 32 points allowed to Cal, most of them were after halftime, when I presume that Washington was just playing it extremely safe and playing backups as well. So the the defense for the Huskies has shown up, no no doubt about it. Um, Washington's only allowing 20.6 points per game, which is 34th, a top 40 scoring defense. They're first in passing yards per game with 399. They're 119th in rushing yards per game, only rushing for 102.3 yards per game. However, you look, you know, a little deeper than that. They're averaging over four yards per carry. So when they run, they're efficient. Will Nixon's averaging nearly seven yards per carry, and Dylan Johnson's averaging 4.9 yards per carry with 430 yards. All of this in spite of a sad injury to Cameron Davis, who was going to be one of the better running backs in the nation, in my mind, before he suffered his tragic injury right before the season kicked off. So Washington can run, and they run pretty effectively, but they need to pass to open up the run because Dylan Johnson, Will Nixon aren't, they, they aren't great enough running backs to, you know, to maximize Washington's win potential. The way that this roster's built, you literally, you know, throw it all the time. To Roma Dunze, to Jalen Polk, to Jack Westover, to Jeremy Bernard, and to Jalen McMillan, all through Michael Penix. That's how you maximize your chances to win if you're Washington in their current situation. They have 193 carries on the ground, 310 passing attempts. That's crazy. To be a top 10 team and to have that, you know, passing attempt to rushing attack ratio is rare. Very rare. Football is often described as a game of inches and a game of physicality. 
that more so involves the run game. To to a large degree, Washington being as highly ranked and as good as they are right now is to a certain degree an outlier. Yet they are also outside of the top 50 in seconds per play. So they're so good at passing the football that they can control the game and also control the clock by passing. That's nuts. It, it just... Another reason why Kalen DeBoer and Ryan Grubb are, are so good at their job. Michael Penix is 2,945 passing yards on the year, 24 touchdowns, 6 interceptions, a 176 passer rating, and an 82.7 quarterback efficiency rating, which is 6th nationally. Caleb Williams has 2,646 passing yards, 25 passing touchdowns, 4 interceptions. He's a 175 passer rating, and he has an 82 quarterback efficiency rating, which is ninth nationally. Both are elite All-American caliber quarterbacks. Both, you know, if, if, the, if the Heisman Trophy was truly about the best player in America and not by record and not by, you know, popularity contest— both of these players, depending on how they finish out their seasons, could have an argument to be in the ceremony. Though I do think even if USC does win out, wins the Big Ten, with, or Pac-12, I'm thinking too ahead of myself, if they win the Pac-12, I still don't think that Caleb Williams would reach the ceremony currently. With his bad performance against Notre Dame and USC already being out of the playoff conversation, I don't think that Caleb Williams is going to even be in the ceremony even if you give USC benefit of the doubt and say they went out and finished 10 and 2 or 11 and 2 because they only have one conference loss this is this is the thing that people are forgetting i said after the utah game that i think this game that this team is going 7 and 5 or 8 and 4 this is still very possible usc's next 3 games are against washington at home oregon on the road and UCLA at home. They could lose all three of those games. They could, even though I think it's extremely unlikely, also win all three of those games. The road trip to Oregon will be particularly challenging, but there's a possibility. After all, Washington last year, um, the first week they entered back into the top 25 after you know losing to UCLA and Arizona State, and they finally climbed back to the top 25, they beat Oregon on the road last season, despite Oregon looking like the much better team entering that matchup. I think that wide receiver, it's undisputable that Washington's superior there. Defensively, USC, I mean, you just look at the, the points they allow per game. You know, instinctively, and also in watching these teams play, USC, I think, might have a superior pass rush. They have 23 sacks to... Washington's 10, but then again, USC's entire goal on defense is to send pressure and to force turnovers, because if they don't, then they allow a big play for a touchdown. Washington's defense can bend in between the 20s, but they don't always break, while USC's defense is always broken and is guaranteed to break if they don't get a sack or a turnover or some kind of a play for loss. Washington has 38 passes deflected, 9 interceptions. USC has 30 passes deflected, 6 interceptions, 10 forced fumbles. Once again, USC getting a ton of forced fumbles, um, a fair amount of interceptions, though not as much as last season, if my memory serves me correctly. Last season, through a total of 14 games, USC had 19 interceptions. They're, they're likely not going to reach that number this season, even if, let's say, Penix and Bo Nix and whether it's Ethan Garbers, Colin Schley, or Dante Moore have an off game for the Bruins. I like Washington a lot when it comes to position advantages, but USC is home field advantage, and that run game, Washington has struggled to defend the run. They've struggled to run the football. They wouldn't be so efficient at running the football, Washington, if they ran the ball as much as they passed per game. They wouldn't have that efficient run game. They're efficient on the ground because they are extremely selective 
as to when they run, and they're very strategic. It's Running the ball is not their identity. It's, like, comparable, honestly, to a service academy. A service academy sometimes will have ridiculously high passer ratings when they pass the football, but that's because they run the football so much and they're so selective when they pass that if they catch your defense off guard and actually complete an accurate pass, it's typically a big play because the opposing defense is always expecting the run, they play the run, etc. And this is how Washington, in part, was able to gain enough of a lead on Oregon in their matchup to when Washington had inconsistencies and Oregon retook the lead, Washington was still in striking distance. Because in the first half, Washington was surprising Oregon constantly and confusing their defense by running the football with Dylan Johnson. And that opened up lanes for Michael Penix to throw to wide open Roma Dunze, Jalen McMillan, Jalen Polk, Jeremy Bernard, etc., he also missed a lot of open receivers in that game, too. This receiving core for Washington is extremely dangerous. But Penix has to deliver. That's why he's my player to watch. If he has a bad game, it won't matter how elite his receivers are. USC's you know turnover-thirsty defense will take advantage of him. I mentioned earlier that he's top 10 in the nation in quarterback efficiency. Michael Penix is. Penix is a veteran quarterback. He is a sixth-year senior, 6'3", 213 pounds. He stayed healthy all of last year. He stayed healthy for most of this season. He's improved in every way compared to last year. He's only, you know, seven touchdowns less than his total last year through the air. He's averaging 10 yards per pass attempt as opposed to 8.4 last year. He's completing 68.8% of his passes as opposed to 65.3 in 2022. His main difference is he's not running the football as much. He only has 12 carries for negative 9 yards. This season, last year he had 35 carries for 92 yards and 4 touchdowns with a long scramble of 30. So, can Penix deliver the football? Um, that's not a guarantee, like we've seen for every game this season, except for, I mean... Even in the Michigan State game, he had some bad throws. His receivers just helped compensate for those. Penix, as college football nerds, puts it very eloquently, is either very hot or very cold. If Michael Penix Jr. is hot for the entire game, then USC has no chance with the defense that they field. Because Washington, we know, has a better defense. Penix, Penix himself decides the game in a lot of respects. Because even if Caleb Williams has an awesome day, if Penix performs to 95% of Caleb Williams' 100%, Washington's defense is that much better than USC's to where they will force a few stops from USC's offense. And USC's defense, you know, might get a sack or two or, you know, maybe get Penix to throw one awful interception. But outside of that, Washington will be scoring on every drive and likely scoring touchdowns, not field goals. So Penix by himself, I mean, I, I could put him up here and say he's the only player to watch because this game totally depends on him. And I think that'd be an accurate assessment. But I don't want to snub Marshawn Lloyd. Marshawn Lloyd has been a key to USC's success this season with his explosive runs, his power, his determination to finish is extremely admirable. 766 rushing yards, 7.7 yards per rush, eight rushing touchdowns. I don't think Lincoln Riley uses him enough, if I'm being honest. A Marshawn Lloyd only had 17 carries against Cal with a long of 56. He only had seven carries against Utah, eight against Notre Dame. And early in the season, he wasn't used a ton, but against Arizona State, Colorado, Arizona, and Cal, he had, you know, more than 10 carries. That's only in four games. I get that you have Caleb Williams, Mario Williams, Dorian Singer, Deuce Robinson, and also have, uh, blanking on this name, my apologies, gosh, the, the wide receiver, Zachariah Branch, my bad. 
elite returner. He's going to be an All-American, I'd say, you know, no, probably next year or maybe at the latest 2025. I understand, Lincoln Riley, that you have all these weapons. And USC has 313 passing attempts, 269 rushing attempts. And their most successful offenses in 2017, 2018, 2019... Oklahoma ran the ball more than they passed. USC hasn't done that for two years in a row. I don't don't think they did it last year. Last year, they were a more pass-heavy team. 515 attempts to 473 carries. So actually, this season, they are more imbalanced in terms of passing attempts to rushing attempts than they were even last year. Lincoln Riley's not running the football enough. And if he runs the football more and let's say Lloyd gets more than 20 carries and Austin Jones gets, you know, more than 10, I think there's a really good chance that USC can control the game and put more pressure on Penix. And by putting more pressure on Penix in a way that doesn't involve your defense, combining that with Alex Grinch's knack to find ways to get pressure, that's the one thing that he's good at on defense, maybe USC can get Penix to make a lot of key mistakes and come out with a win. Regardless, I think that this is Washington's game to come out and shine. I understand where football power index is coming from, and I understand in my mind that I imagine Vegas is looking at this game and, you know, really liking USC's chances here. And it is, in in large part, um, you know, suicide to pick against Vegas. However, I think that in the same way that, okay, Nebraska, I'm going to be doing a preview and prediction video for this Big Ten matchup. This is a future Big Ten matchup, but for an actual Big Ten matchup, I'm going to be previewing Nebraska-Michigan State tomorrow. I don't think Vegas can comprehend how awful Michigan State is because Michigan State has been favored They've even been favored in some small matchups, or they have been slight underdogs, only to get blown out, whether it's by Michigan, Minnesota, um, choking a game against Iowa, Rutgers, they played close, but the Scarlet Knights still came out on top, although I think Michigan State covered. Um, They failed to cover totally against Maryland, who was a seven-point favorite, and they failed to cover against Washington. I don't think that Vegas can comprehend how bad Michigan State is. I also don't think Vegas can comprehend how awful USC's defense is. And even looking at Caleb Williams and looking at the offensive genius that is Lincoln Riley, there's something broken about this USC offense. And I think that Washington's going to you know, pass for 500 yards or more, and the defense will force a turnover, whether it's a Marshawn Lloyd or Austin Jones fumble, a Caleb Williams fumble, or a Caleb Williams pick. They'll force one or more turnovers to end up winning by double digits and and closing out this game. The Huskies have the superior offensive line and defense. That's the biggest reason I'm picking them to win. Again, only reason Michael Penix is the, the man who decides the outcome of this game is because his defense is that much better than USC's. He can make more mistakes than Williams, and USC could still win by double digits. Um, or Washington, rather, could still win by double digits. USC could also win by double digits if Penix makes enough mistakes. This is USC's last shot to contend for the Pac-12. If they lose this game with how Oregon's playing, I guarantee you that Oregon beats this team. And with three losses, they're not making the Pac-12 championship game. Don't kid yourself. They might be able to make it with two conference losses, depending on if the Pac-12 cannibalizes itself or not. But that would involve a lot of complicated tiebreakers. If you're the Trojans, you just want to win this game. You do. Even if USC wins out, I'd be very hard-pressed to say that Alex Grinch returns next year with the disastrous numbers the defense puts up. If, If you're scared of USC winning out, if you're a Trojan fan, and that means Grinch is kept... I don't think you have to worry because the defense at this point has been so woeful that winning out would be viewed as miraculous and that would be good on Riley. 
that wouldn't, barring an, a miracle of biblical proportions, Alex Grinch's reputation is already ruined. He has to go. He must be stopped and must be fired after this season. Once again, I think his defense will be an open door. USC, after losing this game, will become unranked. Alex Grinch, I'd say November 19th, like a Trojans Wire article put it, he'll be out the door November 19th. Um, Or if, let's say, USC reaches the Pac-12 championship game, it'll be after that game. Or maybe before that game, I don't know. But his firing will be announced, just, I would say, after the regular season concludes. So Washington 56, USC 45. I'm not very confident in this pick. I'm Part of me is confident that U- USC will lose, that their defense will look anemic and just very you know, impoverished and poor. However, Vegas knows things. There's a reason that Vegas stays in business, and I have a very strong feeling they love USC here. Again, look at the amount of my subscribers that are picking Washington to win. Right now, you can look up Washington versus USC Action Network, which has the percentages of you know how many public bettors are picking X team. 66% of public bettors are picking Washington outright to cover. And then if you go to public betting and you look at Moneyline, and you know you scroll, the scrolling feature isn't working, but you go again to Action Network, go to public betting, click on money line, and this is a night game as well. Night game environments are typically harder than you know noon or midday afternoon. Fifty six percent of people are picking Washington money line. It was higher earlier today. It was about sixty percent, maybe seventy percent Washington. It's come down by quite a bit, but still, Washington is the public favorite. I feel like USC is the darling of Vegas for this weekend, but mentally, taking Vegas out of the equation, I am confident Washington wins because I think they have the better defense, offense, special teams, and coaching staff. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notification bell. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons, Crash2488, my Heisman patron, Spencer Bringhurst, Noah DDLC, and SFS Inverted, my All-American patrons, and Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, and Austin Christmas, my All-Conference patrons. Have a great night, guys, or a good day, as at the time of this recording, it's about you know 8.45 Eastern Standard Time, but that means just 5.45 Pacific Standard Time. So if you're a Trojan or a Husky, you still have a lot more of your day left. Have a great day. Bye-bye.